Is this thing on? Welcome back to Big Mouth and fancy seeing you here in June. A very welcome, my friends, and especially my enemies. Come in, sit down, no touching. Oh, I don't do the touching. That really, really did hurt. Welcome back to Big Mouth, and you can keep this and any other conversation I ignite going over on my Twitter, at Movies TV Mad, over at my Vero, at Big Mouth One, and the extension to this channel. Why isn't anyone coming over to my Instagram? Big Mouth. It's a lot of fun. It's like mini bite-sized Big Mouth. So come on over. So we've got lots to get through today. And I mean, get through. Geeks on our knees. Let's go. But first of all, let's take ourselves back. Let's get in that DeLorean or that TARDIS and go back to 2017 and talk about what, people, what the media and bloggers were talking about. Justice League, the big build-up. And do you know what? I remember hearing Zack Snyder talking about the opening battle, which we now know is the history lesson that Whedon condensed so badly as being, and this is what this article says, and I think it's a, it's a screen rant one, that Justice League's opening battle looks like Lord of the Rings with spaceships. What did you think when you first heard that? I thought, fucking hey, fucking hey, this is going to be awesome. Jesus Christ. They took the man's awesome opening Lord of the Rings prologue, condensed it down, and it looked cool, but we didn't get nearly what we thought we were going to get from it. So there's a lot of release to Snyder Cut talk today, and we're going back to 2017, first of all, to read this article. Hot off the heels of the actually pretty okay Justice League trailer. Pretty okay. There's even more info dropping. The time it's about the opening scene from Justice League inv involving a Lord of the Rings style battle for Earth. It's best to start off slow. And we've actually already seen glimpses of it from the trailer. As I said, when I first heard about this and they were talking about a Lord of the Rings type prologue, you know, battle with spaceships. And I just thought, wow. Lord of the Rings opening prologue is awesome. This is what they're going to do. I couldn't wait. I was so pumped for this movie. And I think that's why we're all heartbroken after we saw the theatrical cut. This wasn't the movie we were promised. No, we say it with other movies, but this actually wasn't the movie we were promised. During a set visit that Grace Randolph didn't go to, according to some people, Screen Rant got the scoop on just what is going down. In the prologue for Justice League, the opening scene revolves around parademons, which you may remember from Bat's weird nightmare in Batman v Superman. You mean Bat's awesome nightmare, trying to conquer Earth, but being stopped by the combined might of mankind, the Amazons and Atlantis. Spoiler, Earth wins. Apocalypse, Apocalypse army leave behind three mother boxes to be divided between the three armies who all go their separate ways never to meet again, until a certain Justice League forms which sees Atlantis, the Amazons and mankind team up again to face a very familiar threat. So just imagine it, right? You think what they did in Avengers Endgame was awesome, right? Well, this only took Zack three movies. Some people think that's rushed. But actually imagine the Amazonians, the Atlanteans, the humans all combining together at the end of this Justice League movie. How awesome would that, would, would that have been? I mean, the third act of um, Justice League is freaking terrible. Not terrible, but it's just so simplistic, isn't it? And when it finishes, you think, that's it. So the choice to frame the Justice League's debut with an ancient war is a brave one. But as you can see from the steel from the trailer below, it's certainly going to be epic. Talk about putting it all putting all of your chips on the table. Um, I don't think it's brave. Um, I'm not taking any way, anything away from Zach and Chris Terrio. I don't think it's brave. I just, it's ambitious. It's awesome. It's epic. You're giving the consumer something. Unlike Disney do, you're giving us something. Uh, and it wouldn't have felt rushed. It would have felt awesome. Imagine the, imagine the opening scene, seeing maybe a narration from Gal Gadot, AKA Diana, Wonder Woman, right? And you see this. How awesome would it have been? Directed. Hang on. Right, hang on. 
Yeah, directed by Zack Snyder, starring Ben Affleck, blah, blah, blah. So I just wanted to read you that because there was, there's been a, a bit of doubt about what the opening scene of the Snyder Cut is. Have absolutely no doubt it's this history lesson. It's this Lord of the Rings spaceship battle, but it's not a spaceship battle. It's the Lanterns, it's the Atlanteans, it's the Amazonians. Imagine that history lesson. And it's a long history lesson, a lot longer than what we got. Imagine that being the opening of the Snyder Cut of Justice League. So basically, they went to the set. They know this is true. Zach confirmed this to them. We were going to get this epic history lesson, Lord of the Rings type prologue, and it would have been awesome. And as I said on the top of the show, when I first heard about this, I was so excited, pumped. So I went and saw Justice League, and what did we get? Oh, yeah, the uh, kids taking a video of Superman with the mobile. Not as compelling. As I say, I can understand what Whedon was attempting to do. He was trying to show us what the world, what Superman meant to the world. And I appreciate that. But fuck me, <laughs> I would have rather have seen that. Wouldn't have you? So I just wanted to talk about that. I want you to comment down below about this. This isn't, this isn't the end of today's DCEU Daily, by the way. We're Friday already. Imagine that. We've got a lot to get through. So let's get through it. So on Sunday, lots of people we didn't think would hashtag release the Snyder Cut did it. But and I kind of retweeted Diane Nelson, the former CEO of DC, um, retweeting it. But this is a kind of conversation between a fan, I think, in, in a DM. And this is what she had to say. And I think this is great. Thank you for the courtesy of asking if Zach feels he had the time and resources to finish a cut to his satisfaction and he would like fans to see it. Nothing would make me happier than for him to have that opportunity. He earned it. It was and was not only a great filmmaking talent, but a true gentleman and a professional in all his dealings with the studio and DC. So, again, this comes no surprise to us Snyder stands, us DCEU fans. People who have dealt with Zach over on Vero. I mean, he's never replied to me, but I've seen other responses. He is a gentleman. He does appreciate the fans. And it comes to no surprise that him and Diane had a healthy working relationship. And it seems to me that um, Diane Nelson was, as I've said before, one of the good guys. And this is my problem with the Internet. We react very quickly. We can't help it. We're passionate. We, we, we're protective of certain people like we are of Zach. And we went for Diane. I, I personally never did, but I know a lot of people that did. It's not a good look when you don't have the facts. It's very clear to me now that she was a supporter and Jeff Johns was, a, was the problem. And I'm going to read you out um, a, a something I tweeted about the Jeff Johns and Zack Snyder in differences. Yeah, so this is what I had. I did a bit of a thread about the, the we don't know what happened between them, if anything, right? But this is my opinion on, on the situation between Jeff Johns and Zack Snyder. So on this Jeff Johns, Zack Snyder situation, it's pretty simple to me. You've got Jeff, who is DC, who is a DC Comics purist. Then you've got Zack, who likes to put these characters in the real world. Neither concept is wrong, but having both these entities running a franchise was asking for trouble. Let me give you, I'll give a little example here. Us Brits love our cup of tea. Some like it strong, some like it weak. If two people who want a different toned cup of tea both make the drink, you will never get a drink of tea. You either go one way or the other. If you go with Jeff, then you get an interconnected DC universe that adheres to the comics. Or you go with Zach, you get MOS and BBS. I love both concepts, but you can't have both concepts in one franchise. This is not a situation of betrayal, but of bad decision making by the studio. And this goes back to my point and my opinion of whoever was running the studio at the time, if it was Sujihara, I don't know back in 2013, but they went and got Nolan. Nolan wasn't interested in personally moulding this franchise, so he went and got Zach. Great! But the studio wanted Jeff Johns involved. So you've got, as I say, you've got these two entities that look at things very differently. Jeff is a DC purist, and Zach makes his, well, you just have to look at Watchmen, don't you? Makes his films a certain way, and he wants creative control. He just doesn't want a direct, he doesn't want a studio to tell him how to direct something. 
And from what you saw from MOS and BBS, that is apparent. And obviously, he actually co-wrote um, the Snyder Cut of Justice League with Chris Terrio. So that, that tells you a lot how into all this he was. So everyone's making out Jeff Johnston to be this bad guy. At the end of the day, Jeff is passionate about DC. He sees the thing differently to Zap. That's why you either have Jeff Johns involved running the whole thing, or you have Zach. You can't have both. And this was the problem. So in the end, the, these two are pulling in two different directions. Even from Man of Steel, Jeff Johns was not happy. He actually said that on, on, on a Vulture article before um, the theatrical cut of Justice League was released. So, and, in, and I remember, even before that, he was saying, people say DC Comics are darker than Marvel. That's not true. He, he said that actually um, our characters are, are, are very, very um, bright, enthusiastic characters. And so basically he sees DC one way and Zack sees it the other. So you couldn't have both these entities working together. And I think this is the whole problem. So Jeff Johns was clearly working against Zack. He wanted Zack off the project. He got Zack off the project. But the way they all wanted to do it, which was to cut Zack's piece of work to pieces and make it into the kind of thing that Jeff thought it should be was the whole problem. And this is why it went wrong. This is why people accuse him of being a snake. He's never going to come out and explain himself, but him stepping down from running the DCEU says everything. Personally, I would give Jeff Johns his own multiverse. Let him develop Green Lantern. Let him, he's a great storyteller, but you can't have People like Zack Snyder and Jeff Johns working in the same franchise. It's never going to work. So here's the first article I'm going to read you today. And this is from Screen Rant, and I think they're all from Screen Rant. Justice League WB's attempt to hide the Snyder Cut made it bigger than ever. This is a great point by Craig Elvey. Warner Brothers have largely ignored, ignored calls to release the Justice League Snyder Cut, but this has only magnified attention around the issue. Released in 2017 as the culmination of the DCEU cinematic experience, Justice League was dismissed by critics and performed badly at the box office. But that was only the beginning of the movie's problems, as fans have spent the past two years demanding an alternative cut. After the struggles endured by uh, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, Warner Brothers reportedly began making changes to Zack Snyder's Justice League vision. When Snyder was forced to step away from the project, even more sweeping alterations were made, with Joss Whedon leading extensive reshoots and remoulding the script. Since Justice League proved so disappointing for many, there have been widespread calls for Snyder's original version to see the light of day. Images and snippets of information have been leaked by the director himself. Various other figures attached to the production making the vast differences between these two cuts very clear. The release, Snyder, the release of Snyder Cut campaign has grown in intensity over recent months, raising money for suicide prevention charities in the process, and has even begun to attract cast members to its cause, including Ben Affleck, Gal Gadda. Unfortunately, the campaign has failed to incite a meaningful response from Warner Brothers, who apparently remain unmoved on the issue. They're not unmoved by the issue. And apparently, before I carry on reading, Zach's been re-followed, re-followed um, by um, DC, the official DC Twitter account and Instagram account. And I think, is it is it Warner Brothers and a few others as well? So very, very interesting things going, uh, is it Warner, or definitely HBO Max have followed him, the official account as well. And I'm going to t talk to. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to show you something I tweeted about that. I'm going to read that out a little bit later. Because as usual, people cast aspersions when saying positive happens, and that kind of confuses me when you're supposed to be part of this movement, especially when what, what, what we're saying is actually true and we're not making it up. Anyway, unsurprisingly, maintaining radio silence may have backfired on Warner Brothers. It's a basic principle of psychology that the more a person tries not to think of something, the stronger that thought will become. In a similar vein, the more Warner Bros. refuse to address the Snyder Cut, the more mythical the unfinished movie feels, increasing hunger and determination among fans to continue campaigning. Despite numerous credible claims to the contrary, Warner Brothers have attempted to paint the existence of the Snyder Cut as an outlandish conspiracy. 
This is obviously another huge mistake. And if there's, if there's one thing comic book movie fans love more than superheroes, it's a good Hollywood conspiracy. As a direct result of this lackluster response, the Snyder Cut has become somewhat of a cultural meme. Rob Liefeld referenced the topic in his Brigade comic, the otherwise unrelated areas of geekdom, and now jumping on the bandwagon by using release the Snyder Cut as a go-to geek phrase. The quote has now started permeating the mainstream, used in some cases by those with hardly any knowledge of the actual situation, much like a teenager wearing a Metallica shirt despite only vaguely knowing the chorus to Enter Sandman. However, this exposure gives the Snyder Cut even more publicity and reach, which is exactly what we want. Cast members calling for the release of an alternate cut that supposedly doesn't exist is of course embarrassing for Warner Brothers, but things needn't have, have come so far. The studio has had ample opportunity to confirm an original cut Justice League exists and perhaps even explain why certain creative decisions were made. Warner Brothers also might put the Snyder Cut out into the world as a DVD bonus similar to the Director's Cut that came bundled with the home media release of Batman v Superman that many fans prefer, incidentally. But nothing of the sort has transpired. The launch of HBO Max streaming service offered yet another charm to silence calls for a Snyder Cut, this time at a minimal expense and with very little to lose. If the Snyder Cut is great, the DCEU becomes cool again. If it's just as bad as the theatrical version, Warner Brothers are shown to have been right all along. Still, there has been no shifting in the Warner Brothers strategy. But the more they sit back and hope fans will forget about the Justice League Snyder Cut, the bigger the sense of inevitability around its release becomes. Well, brilliant article. Who was he again? Brilliant article by Craig Elvey. little shout out. So maybe he's on Twitter and we can all give him a little follow. Obviously a, a supporter. Um, absolutely. They have stayed quiet all along. Um, they tried something on. They tried a crazy thing on to cut a man's film to pieces and marvelize it. And it failed. You failed, right? Now you've got a new leader in Ann Sarnoff. You've got someone totally new running the DC movie franchise, Walter Hamada. He's doing a fabulous job. What are you waiting for? Are you worried that this Snyder Cut is going to be so good you might have to rethink what you have to do? You're already creating different multiverses. Zax can be one of them. You can do something really ambitious here and blow the MCU out of the water. This could be a touchstone moment. What are you waiting for? Just release the Snyder Cut for crying out loud. Let's take a break from the Snyder Cut talk for, for a moment. We'll get back on that because there's more to talk about, obviously. But now we're talking about J.J. Abrams and it says, is J.J. Abrams making DC's next Superman movie? He says, not well. Basically, he said not yet, right? Let's read this. J.J. Abrams has denied that negotiations to, to, for, for him to make a new Superman film have taken place. Created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, the character of Superman, a.k.a. Clark Kent, Kal-El debuted on the pages of Action Comics 1 back in 1938. Alongside Batman and Wonder Woman, he ultimately became core and hugely popular character within the world of DC Comics. As such, despite being occasionally dinged, overpowered and notoriously difficult to translate, no, he's not to screen, he has been adapted numerous times across the decades. In both animation and live action, he was most recently portrayed in three cinematic outings by Henry Cavill, despite the underwhelming performance of Justice League. Cavill still insists he's still DCEU Superman. Abrams, meanwhile, is a prolific writer, director and producer, as well as helping to create such well-known, well -known, if often divisive, television shows like Lost. Lost wasn't divisive, Lost was awesome. He has also helmed installments of numerous big screen franchises. Abrams co-wrote and directed Mission Impossible 3 before working on even more cultural beloved properties. He directed Star Trek 2009. Reboot of Star Trek starring Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto in 2013. He returned to direct his less popular sequel, Star Trek Into Darkness. Abrams has since departed the intergalactic play playground with Noah Hawley set to write and direct Star Trek. Instead, Abrams ventured to a galaxy far, far away directing Star Wars The Force Awakens before signing on to replace Colin Trevorrow and close out the new trilogy and the entire Skywalker saga with Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. 
Abrams recently spoke with Rolling Stone in order to promote the highly anticipated episode 9. In the progress, in the process, he touched on a number of subjects, including divisive nature of Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi, original, original creator George Lucas' criticism regarding The Force Awakens, a way, way the world of Star Wars. However, discussions briefly turned to the huge deal that had been struck between Abrams and Warner Media, worth over $500 million. The deal had many questioning the impact it might have on existing franchises. One idea that continually cropped up was that Abrams may finally direct a Superman film. Asked about it directly, Abrams had this to say, we haven't, dis we haven't had those discussions yet. Yet. The outlet was quite quick to know that Abrams' answer didn't sound wholly convincing. They also noted the numerous Superman action figures that decorate his offices. Mm, interesting, exciting. Abrams was, of course, previously attached to direct a cinematic su Superman outing, tentatively titled Superman Flyby. The project even had a script and was ready to go before it was ultimately scrapped. Based on previous comments, Superman Flyby would have shared similarities with Man of Steel. Brandon Ralph and Cavill were said to be in contention for the coveted role before both would go on to play Superman in separate, separate outing. The former is set to reprise a version of the role in the coming months with Ruth, Ralph playing Kingdom Come Superman in Arrowverse. And he looks great in the screen grabs, doesn't he? Can't wait to see that. In two years since Justice League's troubled production, a campaign has raged to see director Zack Snyder's original vision released. It recently went to a whole new level, with even Justice League cast members lending their voices in support. Though Cavill wasn't among them, fans remained just as eager to see him once again don the cape. Whether or not Abrams has indeed had those discussions remains to be seen. Equally, it's unclear whether it will see Cavill return or reboot as similar to the one being experienced by Matt Reeves. Upcoming film, The Batman. Whatever case, fans will no doubt be divided between those wanting Abrams' no doubt nostalgic version of Superman realise and knows who rage against it. Right, we pretty much know, right, this is, like, actually, right, before we get into this, this is a similar situation to the Joker. Yesterday, right, the Joker sequel, Todd Phillips came out and said he's only had tentative talks about a sequel, he hasn't walked into a room demanding a character, he's been working with Warner Brothers, he says, for 15, 16 years, he's always had a great relationship, he would never walk in demanding anything. I've told you my opinion. Hollywood Reporter just got a bit over eager and published and published this announcement too soon. It, it, it is irrelevant whether Todd or JJ are in talks now, tomorrow, or in six months. A Joker sequel is going to happen, whether you want it to or not. JJ Abrams is going to create a Superman universe, whether you want him to or not. We don't have a say in this. We have the right to reply. We have a right to, you know, air our, air our opinions, but we can't control the situation. It's as simple as that. Now, actually, J.J. Abrams doesn't have a, a kind of Richard Donner type uh, mythic Superman in mind. We know from everything he said to us about Superman Flyby, it was going to be a very ambitious different take. A take where Krypton isn't destroyed. That's something I was hoping they might do in Man of Steel. But all the purists died. You know, you know what they're like. But I thought that would have been ambitious. And ultimately, Superman even dies, comes back to life, and in the end leaves Earth to return to Krypton. Ambitious, awesome. I'd love to see Superman fly by. I'd love it. So th this is the scenario I'm thinking about. I have a JJ is going to write a, a Star Wars movie with Zack Snyder where Zack Snyder directs it. So they both write it and um, and Zack directs it, maybe. Or maybe Zack will just be involved. Maybe Zack won't be involved in it at all. Maybe JJ will write and direct it. Or there's another scenario that we do get a direct sequel to Man of Steel, directed by Zack Snyder. And this guy, JJ Abrams, is told by Warner Brothers and Sarnoff and uh, Walter Hamada, Right, they're doing their Superman, you do yours. Create a universe, create Superman, Supergirl, this one, the other, create the Superman family, create the whole world, make it an Elseworld story and do as many films as you want. I think the latter is more realistic. I think Walter Hamada is already opening different pockets of this universe. 
in the multiverse. Now, they haven't officially said it's a multiverse, but obviously, either the Batman is a consequence of Diana's decision in Wonder Woman 1984, or he's a multiverse Batman, right? Which means Ben Affleck's one still exists within the DCEU. So I think Henry's Superman may be with Zack Snyder, and I think JJ can do his thing. But, you know, Zack and JJ may make a Superman film together. But have no doubt, people, J.J. Abrams is going to make a Superman film, whether you like it or not. And I don't give a... I'm only going to come from my own point of view and my opinion. I don't care what people think. I want it to happen. I'm desperate for a Superman film. I'm so desperate I spat on my bloody laptop. But I'm so desperate. I love Superman. I fell in love with Superman from the age of 10, from Superman the movie. I, Superman should always be on TV, should always be in film. He's the best, in my opinion. So it's going to happen whether you guys like it or not. I'm sorry. Yes, so we're back to the Snyder Cut chat. Joss Whedon's Justice League reshoots had almost 80 new script pages. Doesn't really... I mean, I know this is supposed to shock me and shock us, I mean, look, obviously that's a considerable amount of script, but is it a script or is it, if it's a description of what he wanted to do, that's quite a lot. If 80 pages, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but you think about the average movie script, it's got to be at least a thousand pages, surely. I mean, I've, I've written a few myself, but obviously rejected or I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you. But people I've spoken to, I mean, 80 pages isn't that much, but let's give this a read. This is by Christopher Fiducia. I'm always butchering names, sorry. A new report claims that Joss Whedon's reshoots on Justice League contain nearly 80 new script pages, while the Marvel Cinematic Universe focused on solo movies leading up to their big team-up film. The Avengers DC took a different route and jumped into Justice League before giving all of the main characters their own solo film. It's obviously what this guy thinks, right? Zack Snyder directed DC's team-up film, but due to a family tragedy, not lies, Joss Whedon was brought in to finish the movie for Warner Bros. Unfortunately, the changes that Whedon made to the movie are believed to be part of the reason why Justice League was panned by fans and critics. Yes, that is the reason. It's a mess. It's a mess. I don't even blame Whedon. He was brought in, offered 30 pieces of silver, he had to turn one man's movie into a Frankenstein's monster, and he failed. And anyone who was asked to do this would have failed. Shortly after the film's release, it was revealed that a significant portion of the film was changed from Snyder's original vision. Reports claimed that around 15 to 20 percent of Justice League had been reshot. Now, that's not really a lot, but it's what they did with that percentage, which is shocking by Whedon, with several of his scenes taken out of the final cut of the film. Like his previous work on the DC Extended Universe, Justice League was going to be much darker and even introduced Darkseid. Snyder has been very present on social media, often posing behind the, posting behind the scene looks at what fans could have gotten with his version of the film. Because he's smart. It's a war. And in war, you use what you've got at your disposal. And he's got us, and he's got his whole version of his movie. Now, a new report reveals how much of the script was actually changed. According to the New York Times, bloody hell, this is amazing, the New York Times. Where did I miss this article from? Warner Brothers hosted a small screening for a few filmmakers, including Whedon, who Warner Brothers hired in hopes of making Justice League a success, like what Whedon accomplished with the Avengers in 2012. At the time, Justice League was only a rough cut, and Warner Brothers gave Whedon, eight, uh, Whedon 80 new script pages to shoot. Despite his best efforts, fans and critics responding negatively to Justice League. And soon after the film's release, fans started demanding Snyder's cut of the film. Two years later, fans still haven't gotten their wish granted, but that hasn't stopped them from setting the internet ablaze with their request. Even the cast and crew of Justice League have shown their support for the release of the Snyder Cut campaign in the past few weeks. Gal Gadot, Ben Affleck, Ray Fisher, Jason Momoa have all supported the Snyder Cut. Despite the clear desire from fans and the people who worked on the movie, Warner Brothers still doesn't have any plans to release the Snyder Cut. We don't know that, and they don't know that, by the way. Even though Warner Brothers spent a lot of money on the reshoot for Justice League, finishing the Snyder Cut could cost 30 to 40 million. 
Oh, you're so misinformed. It's so embarrassing. I wish I didn't say your name. I wish I didn't read your article. But I just think we all need to hear these things. Stop this 30, 40 million thing. The thing's bloody completed, right? It doesn't need 30, 40 million. Oh, what a joke. Because of the incomplete special effect sequences, actually, they're complete. The Snyder Cut has been generating a lot of buzz lately, but Warner Brothers might just not be too keen on spending that much money. There's no money to spend on a new version of a movie that is already released. If they did decide to release the Snyder Cut of Justice League, however, fans would no doubt support the film. Yes, it will make a ton of money. Even the, 30 to, the imaginary 30 to 40 million will be regained and they'd go beyond that. God. Jesus, honestly, right, I just, we're still here, aren't we? We're still hearing, does it exist? 30 or 40 million is just a joke. And they, it's, 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 it's just like an, an echo chamber, isn't it? You hear it so much, it just makes you dizzy. But I'm bored of this conversation. The film is done. The film is ready to release. Maybe a few touch-ups here and there, but we're not talking about 30, 40 or even 50 million. Release the damn Snyder Cut for crying out loud. Yes, so now we're talking about um, present day DCEU, and that's the Black Adam movie. Now, they're all doing a press junket for Jumanji, the sequel to Jumanji, which I can't wait to go and see, by the way. And The Rock has been talking about Black Adam, and he said something very, very exciting. Justice Society of America will appear in DC Comics movie Black Adam. Star Dwayne Johnson says... Now, this is very, very interesting. I'm going to read the whole thing out to you, but I have a few ideas. I think they're going to expand this into other films. A blast from the DC Comics past is finally getting the big screen treatment as the Justice Society of America will be featured in New Line's upcoming Black Adam, star Dwayne Johnson said Thursday. During the press junket Thursday for Jumanji, the next level, Johnson told Screen Run that the film will introduce you to that world to JSA, the Justice Society of America. Have some of that, Marvel. I cannot wait. Created by editor Sheldon Meyer, writer Garden Fox in the 40s for All Star Comics, the Justice Society of America is notable not only as the first superhero team in comic book history, but because it featured characters owned by both National Comics and All Star Comics publishers. All American publica publications also as the first crossover between rival comic book companies. National, National contributed its characters Dr. Fate, Our Man, The Spectre, the Wesley Dodd version of The Sandman, an entirely separate character from one created by Neil Gaiman in 1988. All American meanwhile contributed The Atom, Al Pratt, the Jay Garrick version of The Flash, the Alan Scott version of Green Lantern and the original Hawkman, Carter Hall. We already know Hawkman's going to be in this movie. Eventually, National Superman and Batman were introduced as honorary members and National's Wonder, and National's Wonder Woman joined full time. Unfortunately, she was written as the Justice Society's secretary. Yeah, thanks to sexism. Well, that's not going to happen this time, is it? And by the end of 1945, National and All-American had emerged to form the company, now known as DC Comics. However, due to a general decline in readership for superhero comics, DC ceased publi publishing Justice Society Adventures in 1951. The characters associated with the team were retired as interest in superheroes began to rise again later in the decade. Green Lantern and The Flash were rebooted as entirely new characters, and in 1960, they were teamed up with Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman and Martian Manhunter to form the first version of Justice League of America. DC unfortunately explained the disappearance of JSA and most of its heroes with a 1961 The Flash story called The Flash of Two Worlds, which introduced the multiverse concept. JSA adventures were said to have taken place on Earth 2, which is why then current versions of DC's heroes had no affiliation with the team. Later, with 1985's Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover event that rebooted the entire DC Comics universe, it was established that the JSA was a precursor to the Justice League that formed during World War II that remains the team's official history in DC Comics universe to this day. Production on Black Adam is slated to begin in June, 
Johnson will produce the film with Danny Garcia and Hiram Garcia via the, their Seven Bucks Productions banner, along with Bo Flynn and executive producer Scott Sheldon of Flynn Picture Co. John Collett Sarah will direct. Though the character is one of Shazam's greatest enemies, Johnson didn't show up as Black Adam in David F. Sandberg's Shazam. Earlier this year, the explanation at the time was that both characters require their own introduction in separate films, something I agree with. But character was teased when the wizard first summons Billy Batson to the rock of entity and tells the story of a champion he had selected thousands of years earlier who became a force for evil and destruction instead of good. A golden hologram appears inside the rock of eternity. As the wizard tells the story, clearly showing the previous champion to be Black Adam. Black Adam will hit theatres on December the 22nd, 2021. Right, this absolutely changes everything. I mean, there's one thing to have Hawkman, but they're having the whole flipping JSA. Now, this is interesting. So we know we're getting Hawkman. You're definitely going to get Dr. Fate. I don't know about Stargirl because... um. She's going to have her own TV show, but they could do their own version. Why not? Multiverses and all that. So we've got, I mean, but Dr. Fate, Dr. Fate. Now, this is interesting because Smallville did a feature length event um, in, back in season nine. Obviously, Smallville is not around anymore, but one of my favorite interpretations of DC Comics and Superman ever. And they did this thing called Absolute Justice, written by Jeff Johns. If you want to know how good Jeff Johns is, I will read his comics. But watch Absolute Justice, a feature-length 90-minute episode of Smallville, where young Clark Kent, pre-Superman Clark Kent, meets the old Justice Society of America. They're old, they've been in hiding, they were driven out by governments. It's a great story. And we're introduced to Amanda Waller. Anyway, they did an awesome version of Doctor Fate. An awesome version of Doctor Fate. And... If they, if they go anywhere near that, this is amazing. We're actually going to get a film with Dr. Fate in it. So not only have we got Black Adam, it just goes to show you the ambitions of The Rock, of Danny Garcia, of, is it Hi Hiram, whatever his last name is, right? But we are finally expanding this universe. Black Adam sounds like a really, really ambitious um, movie. But not only that, we also know... As we read on here, in the JSA, eventually, Wonder Woman, Batman and Superman joined the, the original Justice League, which is the Justice Society of America. So saying that, what JSA are they going to be? Have they some, somehow time traveled from the past? Are we seeing this from Black, Black Adam being in that era? Because obviously Black Adam must be forever, right? Because he's, he's got eternity, right? So is Black Adam in that era for a little bit where we meet the original JSA, including a different version of Superman and Batman? And who plays these versions? That Batman can't be Ben Affleck, even though it's still within the DCEU. Batman's human. So it would have to be... Well, this is, this is the interesting thing. Was there another version of Batman? Who knows? Or have they come from another multiverse? And then who plays that era of Superman as well? So they've obviously had to come from another multiverse. So this expands things. This makes Black Adam not just a precursor to the fight that Shazam and Black Adam are going to have in Shazam 3. This makes it a broader spectrum and a broader rewrite of the DCEU. Now, this is very connective to whether we get the Snyder Cut or not, because I kind of suspect here that this is more of a concept. This film is going to be more of a consequence to what happens in Wonder Woman 1984. This would hint now, with what they've announced with Black, with Black Adam, that the screen, the, the test screening I saw of Wonder Woman, which wasn't of the Flashpoint thing, isn't the film we're actually going to see. And this is maybe why Warner Brothers are hesitant to release the Snyder Cut. There's so many things going on. Have you noticed we're trending? The DCEU just keeps on trending, right? Whether it's the Snyder Cut, Black Adam, and Henry Cavill saying he's still the DCEU Superman. There's so many exciting things to be announced. And I'm so excited and proud to be in, as I say, in the right, you know, in the right part of history. I've been part of release the Snyder Cut from the very beginning. There's been times where I kind of thought, 
Was it the right decision to bring Whedon in? Did they do the right thing? But once I saw the results of Justice League, I knew should Zack Snyder have kind of tried to sit down with Warner Brothers and say, right, I want this, but maybe we can do what you want here. At the end of the day, I think Zack Snyder was wrong and Kevin sued you. Sorry, what did I say? Don't turn off. I didn't mean that. Let me start again. Ultimately, I think Zack Snyder was right and Kevin Sujihara was wrong. Uh, but yeah, and I think what's happening now with release the Snyder Cut getting so much mainstream kind of support proves Zack was right. Zack was making an awesome comic book franchise and they took that away from him and of us. Jeez, this is 40 minutes now. This is going to take like 60 years to upload, so I'll be dead anyway. So hopefully somebody sees it. Um, yeah, something kicked off yesterday with this whole Zach getting re-followed by DC and other entities of Warner Brothers, HBO Max. Very, very exciting because that would hint we are going to get the Snyder Cut. So this is what happened. Something kicked off between RT Snyder Cut. Nothing too big because RT Snyder Cut are very placid. Uh, but something actually kicked off kicked off between R.T. Snyder Cut and Stephen, Stephen Colbert, who writes a lot for Screen Rant. He's not necessarily a supporter of release of Snyder Cut, but he has been fascinated by it enough to write about it. Uh, so let's see what goes on. Yeah, right, this is, this is what Stephen said. So they're getting in this conversation about if Zach was re-followed really by these Warner Brothers entities or if the follow was there all the time. So Aries20 says, I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. But in the app, if you share the same following with WB, then it appears on the top. But if you don't, it drops to its real position. So I don't really want to get into too much. So RT Snyder Cut do say it appears that Warner Brothers and WB Pictures have today followed Zack Snyder on Twitter, which is really, really exciting which it means they originally unfollowed him, but they're following him back now. That's very positive for release to Snyder Cut. So Stephen Co Cobe M. Cobert, we've spoken about him already, chimes in. Yeah, check on desktop. It's all chronological there. He was one of the originals they followed, actually. So Stephen is trying to insinuate that there's no refollow. They never unfollowed him. So... This, this is, um, where are we? Yeah, here it is. RT Snyder Cut, released the Snyder Cut. Actually, quote tweet Stephen M. Colbert. And they say this. Actually, when you unfollow someone and then follow them again, it appears in the position that it would have been on the original follow. Yes. As you know, we have promised not to share rumours. And we shared this because we, we received a notification that they followed him Today, we should highlight that this doesn't necessarily mean anything. We are just reporting to you what it what that it happened. What conclusions you wish to draw from this information is for you to decide. Absolutely. One of one is two. They followed him for a reason, haven't they? As promised on the first day, we made this account. We do not deal with rumours or speculation. So I actually got a lot of retweets because I quote tweeted everything released to Snyder Cut said, RT Snyder Cut said, because I applaud them. Now, this is what I said, and this is into reference of what Stephen M. Colbert said, because they talk about honesty and integrity. So, so I say, yeah, honesty and integrity is so important. I just don't understand why people would try and insinuate it wasn't a refollow and then claim they support release to Snyder Cut. Very odd behavior. That's true. Now, in truth, Stephen M. Colbert's never claimed. I'm a bit wrong there because he's never claimed he's a supporter. He finds it an interesting subject. He talks about it. He's gained a lot of momentum from it. And he's been pretty honest about that as well because people who don't like him have actually screenshot stuff he said. So I don't think he's a supporter. He's very well in with... Um, uh, with a few other people as well. I think he's kind of well in with Davey Pienaar, the screen junkie, or is it the film junkie, right? Kind of like that guy, he's all right, but sometimes a little bit preachy. John Aaron Garza, he gets on with John Aaron Garza as well. So they're all, if you want to call it the 40 million club, they are part of, of, of that kind of situation. But I just feel that why would you try and insinuate 
something's not true. When you know damn well it is true, it's like you're trying to it's like it's like you're trying to accuse us all, including RT Snyder Cup, that you're actually we're actually liars and you're some official dumb, some policeman who's gonna tell us the truth. And what's happened there brilliantly by RT Snyder Cup, they have sat this geezer down, and I absolutely freaking well love it. And there's another kind of comparison to have here, and I've got to, I've got to finish all this off, and I hope I've fitted everything I wanted to in today's DCEU Daily. I actually haven't stopped for a rest. I paused it now and again, but come straight back. Crazy, right? I'm going to need a drink of water. And actually, I have to put the washing out as well. Anyway, my comparison is to bloggers who keep on like denying the Snyder Cut even exists. It's, it's like what um, Film God did yesterday. He put all these kind of bloggers together and what they've said, oh, don't like Zack Snyder. Why do his fans have to keep on saying that something exists when it clearly doesn't? Uh, Zach told us, and you're obviously calling Zach a liar. Then you've got John Campier actually talking down about Zach, saying, why is he doing this? Why does he keep on going on about a phantom cut? It doesn't exist. Other producers are not going to want him to make films anymore. There's obviously Film Gob shows the kind of headline of Zach now working with Netflix to make his zombie movie, right? Of course people want to work with him. And Netflix are one of those who don't give a crap. Don't give a crap. So Zach's doing well, but he's desperate to get his cut of Justice League released. And so are we. So what did you think of everything we spoke about today? Did you like the video? Didn't you? you like the video? Press like, thumbs up. If you didn't, press thumbs down. I'm quite cool with that. Any reaction? Please share the video. Share the channel. Shout to the rooftops about what we do here. And I'll be back tomorrow with more DCEU Daily. See you then.